Welcome to Vancouver Rape Reliefs 2020 Montreal Massacre Memorial. My name is Florence. I'm a collective member at Vancouver Rape Relief. I'm uh, hosting with my co-host, uh, Dani. Hi, Dani. Hi, I'm also a collective member of Vancouver Rape Relief. And as you may know, this year we are hosting a series of 12 online events. You can find the full program on our website at rapereliefshelter.bc.ca. Uh, so again, we're live here on Zoom for today's event called The Impact of Pornography on Women. And to talk about this, we will have with us Yammer, a member of Radical Girls. She has written and translated uh, papers on male violence and discriminations uh, against women, such as prostitution and pornography. And also Alexandra, she's a feminist currently based in Poland. She's an international relations graduate and a member also of Radical Girls. There will be a Q&A portion. So if you do have questions for us, you can type them in the chat on Zoom. Dani, tell us about uh, a bit more details about the topic of today. Sure. So, um, hi woman. Uh, radical feminists have been critical of pornography since the time we could only find it in magazines. The internet era made pornography easier to access, easier to produce, and led to a mass normalization of it. It is now socially acceptable to watch pornography. And any critique or challenge of this global multi-billionaire industry run by men for men is seen merely as moralist, conservative, and anti-sex. We, radical feminists, understand pornography as filmed male violence against women. It is a disservice to separate pornography from prostitution. They both rely on the profiting of exploitation of women's bodies. Pornography happens to real women. The so-called actresses are actually there, performing what you see on the screen and 88% of analyzed porn scenes contain some sort of male violence against women. It is also impossible to be an ethical consumer of porn when the biggest porn websites like Pornhub host quite a lot of videos posted without the woman's consent, tons of child pornography and rape. The conversation we want to have today is about how the existence of pornography shapes women's lives outside of being involved in the porn industry. We've been having this conversation with each other for a while and we're realizing more and more how much porn has affected us and our experiences. So through consciousness raising, we learned that pornography shaped the way we see our bodies, our sexuality, our relationships. And we also hear from different women on the crisis line that porn clearly influenced their attacks. And to have this conversation with us today, we're happy to introduce uh, you to the collective, Radical Girls. We're really happy that they're here with us. So we have Yammer and Alexandra. So hi women, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank Hello. you. Hello, so and thank you, yes. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about your group. What is, who is Radical Girls and what do you do? Um, so Radical Girls is the young women's movement of the European network of migrant women. And it was created specifically because we saw a gap um, in the transmission of feminist ideas from one generation to the next. And we saw this um, rampant, um, I don't even know how to qualify it anymore, faux feminist ideology uh, explaining to us that our subordination was really our liberation. And it was really to counter that discourse that it was set up and Alexandra, if you want to add anything. I think that's perfect. It was truly also to unite young women, um, to create a space for uh, young women to analyze and discuss feminist ideas in a safe space and to represent the perspective of young migrant women as well, which is uh, very unique. Right, so basically we know that the liberal feminism and their um their like perspective of feminism is very loud so you are you created like this young um group to be able to keep passing along the message of like radical feminism and which comes with abolition of prostitution and pornography and all this absolutely and secularism as well it's also an important value for us 
And so um, we want to propose now um, that we go kind of an around and we can talk a little bit about uh, like how much we are comfortable with and um, how old were you when you were first exposed to porn and how has porn impacted your life? Do you want to start, Flo? Maybe? Yeah, sure. So actually, uh, I don't remember exactly when I was first exposed to porn. For sure, at 16, uh, I was watching porn with my first boyfriend. So it could have been around that time. And I remember us, like, would we, we would recreate scenes that we saw in porn. And we also, like, uh, recreated, like, common stereotypes, like teacher, student, and the, the, the cliches that you see in pornography. And also even perform uh, rape scenes as well. And the same guy actually put a lot of pressure on me to have like anal penetration. And I ended up saying yes. And then I like, I didn't, I never really liked it at first. And then I got to believe that I liked it, but now it troubles me because I feel like I was pressured and I remember how much pain I felt. And I know that he saw this in porn. I can't count on how many times I was coerced into taking pictures of me naked to send to my partner, uh, my partners, all of my partners that I had, all male partners. I was also coerced into letting him film us having sex. And I felt that if I said no, I would be called a prude or a turn off. And other, time, other times I didn't even know, or he didn't ask me and it just happened. I had, and now I know that all my past partners have sexual material of me and the thought of them sharing it online or sharing it with their friends, um, that's definitely crossed my mind and I still think about it. Other thing, other ways I see that pornography impacted my life um, was my hair was pulled many times during sex. Sometimes I asked for it, so other times I, I didn't. Um, I always assumed that that was something very common that everybody liked, even though it made me uncomfortable. I was slapped without my consent during sex. I was pressured to have by one of my boyfriends to have a threesome with a very close um, female friend. I was called also slut and dirty during sex. And there was also, I had one boyfriend who had a period where he would send me a lot of pornographic pictures and videos and that would be all day long, 10 at a time. And he would send me like sexually loaded messages and always asking me to respond and respond in the same way. And then would tell him that I'm not like I'm at work or I don't have anything to say, but he always wanted me to be creative. And then he said, I'm prude and a turn off when I didn't respond. And I felt I was responsible for, for his sexual pleasure, even when we were not in the same city. And the same guy actually also used to buy pornography without me knowing and also he would use my credit card to do so even though I asked him not to and he would continue to do it and apologize every time and I would ask him to not watch pornography and he would still do it and today I think where I'm at is I really don't know my what my sexuality would be like if porn didn't exist I'm questioning everything I like and everything I did in the past and really what would I like if porn didn't exist and I, I can't even think of an of an answer I can't start even imagining what it would be like mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Alexandra do you want to go next sure sure um, so I was exposed to porn at a very young age I think I was around 10 years old mm -hmm. uh, I think it sort of happened by accident but then I just kept watching it out of curiosity and then it gradually became such an important part of my life of my sex life of how I related to my own sexuality um, I think what happened to me is very symptomatic to what happens to many people is that with time I really started watching more extreme imagery and more extreme content so um, by the age of 15, I think I was already watching the most hardcore porn that there is. Mm -hmm. So long before I even started having sex, long before I even had my first kiss, I was already exposed 
to very hardcore pornography and it really bothered me but I kept on watching it because I was now I think I could say I was addicted I just didn't see another way to relate to my own sexuality and I really needed this extreme content to get sexual satisfaction as well and so obviously I started implementing that into my sex life with time it was always out of my own desire um, and yet it always left me feeling really sad it just felt me it, it left me feeling really sad and I think when I was 21 so not that long ago I reached my peak because I would watch this very extreme porn and I would feel so humiliated and I didn't know why and that I guess it also shows how pornography works because I was watching rape and abuse and humiliation of women mm -hmm. and yet in my mind I couldn't understand why I'm sad why this is affecting me because to me that was normal that's just sex that's just porn that's just what it is that's what I enjoy as well I thought and yet yeah I just had this huge disconnection and so I started looking for feminist analysis of pornography and then I discovered that it exists that there is um, an anti-porn uh, or rather anti-sexual humiliation sexual harassment of women feminism and I just felt such a huge relief that I finally got the language to describe what I was watching mm -hmm. that, oh, it's not just sex. It's actually violence. It's actually humiliation and degradation. And I think um, the biggest thing is that it's not that it affected my sex life negatively, but it really negatively affected my own relationship with my sexuality. And that is something that I think is not often talked about. I think there's a lot of this conversation around men watching porn and how that affects their behavior towards women, which is obviously a really important topic. But to me, it was more how I relate to my sexuality, how I internalized um, this desire for violence and for humiliation and how I sexualized it. And to me, um, rejecting porn was actually the first step to reclaim my sexuality mm -hmm. to uh, understand that I do not have to sexualize power dynamics or you know domination of a man over a woman or a person over a person really so yes it's a journey <laughs> it is it is a journey for sure mm. um yeah more um, for me as well, uh, I really like the fact, Florence, that you said that you forgot because for me it was the same. It's kind of, I had a flashback of how when I was a child, I must have been nine and it was the internal uh, pages of a magazine. So it was extremely explicit, but luckily, luckily, in a sense, if you can find luck in this, it was only a woman that I saw and was with friends over the summer, accidentally in a house, an abandoned house or something like that, very random. Uh, I think the question is, who wasn't exposed as a child these yeah. days? Like, are you, I think the very fact that you forgot, it's, it's, it's telling in a way, you remove those images. And also what you said, for instance, stuck with me because it's, whenever you're with a man, you're always on the guard and you cannot let loose of that guard. You always have to be on the edge. Every little gesture, you have to analyze it and it makes it extremely difficult and tiring. And I think that the men you're with do not understand why I'm always on the guard. I'm always, you recognize immediately something that is even mildly pornographic, I think. Um, <sighs> And also what you were saying, Alex, about, I think what you're talking about, it's not just your relationship with your sexuality, but your sense of self. Mm -hmm. That is something that you have to understand. Because that, that feeling of humiliation you have, it's 
internally, even though everybody's telling you she's the porne, she's not a woman, you know she's a woman. You can see herself in her. And inevitably, even if though you don't have a connection, you have it in you, right? Even, I mean, I think that the body never lies. So I think that, you know, this thing of, oh, women are frigid and they have vaginismus and they don't want to let men penetrate them and the body gets rigid, so she's horrible. But no, it means that you just don't want it. You just don't want it. And we are the ones that force it then onto ourselves because it's not just, you know, the subtitle of Andrea Dworkin is men possessing women pornography men possessing women, but then the pornography gets hold of us. It takes control of us and we integrate it so well and it's constantly um, leading our desires. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Dani, I think it's your turn. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I will comment, I can comment on, on all your comments later too, because I think we have, uh, uh, very similar thoughts, especially in relation to how we relate to ourselves. And even like Flo mentioning that um, she asked for a few of the violence that she experienced, she was asking, but really like, why? Mm -hmm. Why was she asking for that? Um, so I think the first time that I, I was exposed to porn, I was around like 11 or 12. And I was at my friend's house and her parents were out and she actually showed me a VHS of her parents having sex. And of course, that some might not consider that porn. And it is true that if the filming is consensual and it never, it never leaves that room where it was filmed, it, it can be not considered porn. But we know how much men use that to threat women after a breakup. And many post the videos in porn websites without the woman's consent and even profit from it. So uh, we'll probably talk more about that later for sure. So I consider that my, my, my first exposure to porn. Um, and then after that, uh, my brother would like have Playboy magazines lay around. Like I don't remember exactly how old I was, but it was like throughout um, my teenager time and so it was casually layer around and he would show me all of them and um he would tell me also over and over how like the perfect nipples and vagina should look like and they should be pink otherwise it's gross uh and of course that the vast majority of playboy magazine covers um they were uh, from white women so i guess like my shame and like my hate for my brown and like hairy body and stuff might have started at that time because I can like remember him repeatedly saying that brown nipples, brown vagina, like it's just gross. So um, yeah, so there's that. <laughs> uh, one thing that makes me like a lot resentful about um, porn that now I see that porn influenced a lot, it was uh, my own, like I sexualized my own bisexuality. So again, it's like, I, I can see how much influenced the way I see myself and the way I, I react and everything else. So, and we know that lesbians are extremely sexualizing porn and also like in real life. And, um, and I know that I've started exploring my bisexuality in a beautiful and respectful memory I have. But as I got older, my make out with girls uh, would be a show for the boys at like house parties. And I would enjoy it, but seeing the boys so excited about it and finding us so cool and sexy made me slowly believe that making out with girls was just for fun and that romantic relationships should be only be with boys. Um, so looking back, I fell in love with a lot of girls, but just never allowed myself to express it and explore it. Uh, it was like fairly recent, like mid-20s that I fell in love with a woman and I actually understood it and allowed myself to express it and explore it like in full, not just sexualizing my own bisexuality. Um, also for sure, uh, porn taught me to connect sex with um, aggress aggressive at it and normalize it very much. And uh, the boyfriend that I lost my virginity with, he would teach me positions by mimicking porn scenes. 
And eventually after the breakup, I saw myself, like Alexandra mentioned, like I would see mainstream porn on a regular basis for a very long time. So that means that I've learned um, most of what I know and experience was like by porn. I've learned from porn. And so I've learned to be strangled and I never felt the extra pleasure they said I would, but I will be, fear will be like a consistent reaction that I will have. Um, I've learned to ask to be slept, is left. Um, even if I will get emotionally, of course, and physically hurt by it every time. And I learned to have my hands forcibly held down so I couldn't choose what was being done to me. Um, I've learned that if I didn't allow guys to actually ejaculate in my mouth, I was not good in sex. And uh, I've learned also that my pleasure never mattered. And I would justify it by calling myself a giver for many years. So not even like understanding why, why am I am I a giver? Why my own pleasure uh, does not matter. So yeah, I'm, I'm like overall very glad that we are having this round and this conversation because it's true. Like we, um, we need to talk more about like how much that influence the way we see ourselves and the way we um, connect sex with violence on our personal experiences too. And um, yeah, for sure now, like Flo said, I, where I'm at is that I second guess absolutely everything that I'm experiencing in sex right now. I'm like, do I like that? I don't think I like that. Or why are you doing this? Like, where did it came from? Like, what are you thinking right now? Like, are you sexualizing me? I really, so it's very difficult. <laughs> because it's like a how to learn what we like and who we are and what like how our sexuality is without porn it's like as alexandra said it's like a journey it's a long way i can't relate to so many things you said <laughs> yeah yeah i'm also very glad we have this conversation and someone in the comments also saying thank you for your honesty about this lots of love so thank you for sharing and we also got messages on one of the Facebook page we're involved with called Because I Was a Girl, Because I Am a Woman. Um, and women are invited to uh, comment about their experience of being a woman and a girl in the world. And one woman says, I was told by the criminal prosecution that my ex photographing our daughter was not that bad and I should be thankful it wasn't worse. And another woman said, at 15 year old, at 15 years old, I suffered from an eating disorder and self-harming because I was not like all the porn stars my boyfriend loved so much. So it's definitely something that a lot of women experience and in very similar and different ways. And that's the, the power of, of sharing it together. Yeah, experiencing things you are like a girl, like a 15 years old, like concern about your body image because she does not look like while her boyfriend is consuming every day mm -hmm. on porn. Another comment here, women's truth, so powerful. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Um, and also what, talking about the sense of self, I think that it, it ties in a bit to what we're gonna, why we started the Radical Girls campaign, right? Um, I, I remember a friend of mine who's almost in her 70s now, who was telling me that after a long marriage, she didn't know who she was. Because she has to second guess everything her husband wants. You have to read your husband perfectly well to make sure he's happy, to make sure you do the right thing. So you lose yourself in that process of living with a man. You don't, where is me? Where is him? Where is me? And I think that this is, pornography makes this happen at a much younger age. Um, you know, it's also what... <laughs> You, you, what German group says you come to this world whole and then you're broken repeatedly and then the rest of your life you have to reconstruct this again. And this is at a much younger stage where you're, you want to be this pornographic star and the second guess this, you have to anticipate everything your boyfriend or the man you're with wants and your pleasure never matters because you don't matter. Yeah. You don't exist. You yeah. don't have, there is no woman, there is just porne. Mm -hmm. But also, I think it really, what it's connected to is this message that liberal culture sends us, which is, 
oh, this is something that you should enjoy and something that you want and something that you truly desire. That's also the message of pornography that whatever happens to those women, it's because they want it and it's because they deserve it. And I think it took me so long to figure out why I'm in so much emotional distress when I watch pornography is that Mm -hmm. when I was searching for answers, all I heard was, oh, but women also watch porn and oh, you're a girl, like you should liberate yourself and explore your sexuality with porn and how porn can be a feminist tool because it liberates you, et cetera, et cetera. And that was something that I was constantly hearing. And that's why I also internalized it as a good thing. And it took me a long, a long while to figure out. Yeah, like that was like your that's what sexuality is about it's like watching porn and learning from it and if you don't do like so you don't have a sexuality exactly exactly that yeah so it looks like we are live on facebook now uh (laughs) facebook uh (laughs) fix the problem so welcome to anybody that's watching uh please let us know in the comment section on facebook that you're that you're there and where you're from in the world and also you can type your questions and comments on there as well and we have a q a portion and we do apologize for this little technical problem but we're happy that you're here now and the recording uh from zoom is going to be released at some point too like from the beginning so that's fine the part that we missed yeah. will definitely uh, make it available uh yeah so Danny, you mentioned you started watching porn, uh, or you were first exposed to porn around 11 and 12, or 12, and I was quite young at 16, Alexandra also quite young. So um, we are really talking about, um, like we didn't have smartphones, iPads, and, but now kids have fast and more accessible internet connection. They have smartphones around 10, 11, even mm-hmm. younger. So then there's Wi-Fi every, everywhere now, so we can, like, we know that kids are boys and girls are accessing porn at quite a young age. Mm-hmm. Some statistics that we found. So a market's research conducted by internet providers found that the average age of a boy first sees porn today is 11. And that's from 2010 and mm-hmm. 2010, 10. And a university of Alberta study found more than one in three 13 year old boys watch porn online too many times to count. So it, it's something, we were young and they're even younger when they're first accessing porn. And accessing way easier now and like yeah. all kinds of like content at once because it's yeah. just so much easier now. And free. Yeah. 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 Um, so the average of men accessing Pornhub, which is the biggest free porn website, is 36 years old. And the internet porn audience skews is younger, but still like 24% of um, 24% are 45 years old or older than that. So not only teenagers and young men are watching porn, men from all ages are watching filmed male violence against women, basically. Yeah, I mean, fathers, judges, politicians, all those older men that actually rule. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we heard from women that we spoke to that uh, actually from older women that they caught their husbands watching porn and they were actually quite disturbed because they figured out that they're watching violent porn or what we could, even though there's a debate of what's considered hardcore porn, but they were watching hardcore porn and they didn't expect that this would happen at such a, um, at, at that age, so over 60. And they're really disturbed also by this behavior and, asking their partners to stop and they're not stopping so again it shows that it it, yes very young and and old as well and so it affects like all women for sure so like little boys little girls young men and women and um older like adults are consuming uh filmed male violence against women Mm -hmm. that's very scary um i think like none of us here at least have any doubts about the harms of porn uh, for the woman in the industry and we can definitely affirm from our personal experiences as we mentioned earlier um, but also a lot from our work on the crisis line uh, shows that the harms of porn are real it is affecting girls and women outside of the industry 
And so I guess um, uh, that leads to my question to Radical Girls. And I think Yamur uh, was about to touch that a little bit, but uh, I know that this year you launch a big online campaign called Dismantling the Myths of Porn mm -hmm. and where you covered 10 myths around pornography. And so uh, why, I wanna hear why did you choose porn as like your first big campaign? So I think it's really um, about the fact that we are, as young women, we are a generation where men from our age, it's impossible to find one that hasn't watched it. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll just find one that is not addicted to it or is not a frequent watcher, but that's the only thing you can hope for. Um, and I think like you, Alexandra, I, mean, I must have been nine. I can't even remember, right? It's, and it's gonna be a lifetime of that. So I think there is something, it is very true that I also hear from older women about older men spitting in their mouths and then saying, oh, you don't know what sex is about or urinating on them. Uh, I was surprised to hear that. I thought it was just young. <laughs> but um, I think it's gonna get even worse because the, the thing that we're talking about, Florence, uh, pornography being introduced as a way, as a norm in uh, heterosexual relationships is gonna be worse for younger girls because they use those media tools at a younger age. So there's an indelible, like uh, a trace that they cannot remove the way maybe past generations could have. Yeah, I think I think also we were really desperate for an alternative perspective on pornography. As I mentioned, the uh, dominant discourse is that porn is liberating. And that's something that I've been exposed to my entire life. And I feel like that is letting women down. Uh, I think that's completely misleading. I think that's gaslighting and it's harmful. And we believed that women need to have access to this sort of information. And that was just our contribution to the conversation because the facts are there um, that pornography is harmful both to women in the industry, to people watching it and to women as a political class, as a social class. It is um, directly contributing to our subjugation as a class um, and we have this knowledge, we have this analysis, but it's difficult to find it. So we just believed, okay, young women need to have access to this. They need, they need to know and, and make their own choices for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's pretty amazing because uh, you can find, because we know that feminists are fighting against pornography since the time that was like in, in magazines, but it's true that because the other discourse is just so loud, you have to actually, if you want to find it, you have to search. And we know that yes. young women are not even there yet. We can remember ourselves and with social media and everything and this whole like empowerment and liberating uh, and like t being in touch with your own sexuality, taking the power, this whole like illusion gets rooted in, in, in our minds so easily. So I think it's, it's amazing that you as a group that focus and targets like young women are like, that was your first big campaign. Cause I think it's definitely one of the most scariest things to me right now. It's like the way that pornography is normalized. It's very mm -hmm. scary. Yeah, no, I, I, I really like, oh, Robert Jensen has a beautiful book on pornography called Getting Off. And it's available for free online, so you really should. Everybody should read it. Um, actually, it's in another one of his books that he says that, but his book on pornography is better. But he says pornography is what the end of the world looks like. Oh. It is true. And I was listening to Sit in Peak from the French group, Was It a Feminism, that is now leading a campaign against uh, famous pornographers in France on the account of pimping, uh, organized crime, rape. Uh, unfortunately, the charges on torture were not accepted. And she was saying that she had heard lots of stories of male violence against women, but she was saying there's something specific to pornography that is the systematic destruction of women. Yeah. And I think like, uh, we want to talk to you about the message that pornography propagates. Um, Pornography is propaganda of male violence against women. Porn normalizes male violence against women. 
Uh, research has found that 88% of analyzed scenes contain physical aggression, which could be like gagging, choking, spanking, and slapping. And that goes, again, we can go back to our personal uh, experience that we were mentioning before about being strangled and everything and being slapped. And 48% of scenes contain uh, verbal aggression, primarily name calling. And perpetrators of aggression were usually male, whereas targets of aggression were overwhelmingly female. And targets mo most often showed pleasure or responded neutrally to the aggression. Again, mm -hmm. pornography enforces the mis misogynistic connection between sex and violence. And uh, for us anti-violence workers, the connection between what you find on mainstream porn and what we hear from women on the lines every day, it's very obvious. Creating a pornified society is one of the most effective tools of patriarchy. And you can see how women are portrayed in advertisement, magazines, movies, this obsession with our bodies and the objectification of it. This is what we were saying, like we consume from, from a very early age, not only from porn, from like media as a whole. And we are talking about the normalization of objectification and exploitation of women's bodies, our own bodies. Uh, we uh, hosted the part one of our panel, race, class, and male violence against women. And Trisha Bhatti from EVE said it very well. She was saying that things we're all fighting against such as racism, classicism, sexism, and ageism, when it comes to pornograph pornography, we give it a pass. Mm. And she says, suddenly, because there is sex involved, it's no longer racism, sexism, classism, ageism. She taught me a new word that she said, it's, it's uh, baffling. And that's exactly what it is for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know that the message that porn are propagating is just, um, yeah, there's no doubts. And especially from our perspective as anti-violence mm -hmm. workers, it's just, there's, it's impossible not to make the connection. Mm -hmm. And we want to hear from radical girls on this, but um, I just wanted to quick note on Facebook, if you can, if you're watching, if you can uh, right away, click share and share it on your, uh, on your page as well, so that more people can watch live because this is such a great conversation. So, and such a topic that needs to be talked about. So please do share um, as it's live so more people can join. Um, so Yammer, you, uh, as part of radical girls and you, published a video that we really loved, uh, even though it is, it is disturbing, but you, where you talk about the different um, names and stereotypes and racism also that's being propagated and reinforced by pornography. So what are some of the messages that are being uh, shared on pornography? Yeah, I think the one that I would like to stress from today's conversation is that women want it. That's a very important message. So why, why is there such a stress on women wanting it? So first, I think there is a need. Um, again, this is Robert Jensen. Um, it's very interesting to read it from a male perspective. There's uh, different nuances. It's very, very interesting. Um, where he says that they know they're doing something wrong, right? Men know they're doing something wrong. Because as much as pornography is normalized, no man goes about saying what he watches. They do sometimes. Now, even that is normalized, but there is still a bit of discomfort. Not everyone is bragging about, for example, prostitution. Every time you ask a man, he's like, mm, no, I haven't been. I haven't been. It's other men. It's never me. And it's the same, you know, the, the, it's not that normalized. So that's the goal we're in now, to make it really normal so men don't have a sense of guilt when they watch it. I am pretty sure they know it's wrong because they come up with this thing of, oh, mine is ethical. Oh, mine is camming. Like, I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. So this is Robert Jensen's argument. They need to believe that the women want it to alleviate their own sense of guilt. So that's one thing. The other thing, I think it's to, it's makes it, it makes a system more powerful if the ones that are subjugated in it willingly participate in it. Because it means that even patriarchy, we're doing the job ourselves these days. Men don't need to do anything. We're upholding patriarchy for them. This is, you know, we talk about later stages of capitalism or whatever. We historicize certain systems, but we never historicize patriarchy because the moment we historicize it, we know it has a beginning. And if it has a beginning, it has an end. So it's always this thing of, 
pornography always existed, prostitution always existed. Those are big lies to make it seem immortal, but it can end. And to me, it's the story of Beauty and the Beast. So Beauty and the Beast, um, a woman is in this arranged marriage and she has to start liking this man. So she starts seeing him beautiful just to bear the violence of it. And it's the same of what you were saying, Florence. I had to convince myself that I liked it because you feel like you can't escape it. And there's another thing also, why is there this insistence of women wanting it? Sorry, um, I'll have two more points. Why is there an insistence of women wanting it? Well, of course, because we women don't have a will of our own. So anything that a man wants, a woman must want. If you think about the film Deep Throat, um, which is, uh, was a further step in the normalization of pornography. And we know the story it was Linda Borman who was used in this film. And then she wrote Ordeal where she talks exactly what happened behind the screen. So her husband being the pimp and threatening her with a gun and forcing all those things on her. But why did men start going to that, to that film with their girlfriends? And it was sort of mainstream, male stream to, to talk about Sheila Jeffries uh, term because this is a woman who has a clitoris at the end of her throat. So she really enjoys giving those fellatio. So it's the fact that she likes what the man likes, right? And it's like what she has no will of her own. She enjoys it too, whatever he does. And then what you were saying, uh, baffling, um, uh, Danny, the thing about being baffling. And I was thinking, why is there a contradiction? Why do we stop thinking this? I had a friend who was telling me, you know, left-wing men, they're so prostitu pro-prostitution these days. But you say, surely it's the biggest alienation of all, right? But no, for some reason, it's, they, they suddenly become liberal when it comes to women. But why is that? And then it hit me, of course, because women are not citizens. We are the poor nay. We are not playing the game. We're outside of it. So all of those nice theories they have, they don't apply to poor Nate. Mm. I think this is, you know, those are the messages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think based on what you just said, yeah, more is that I think especially for young women, it's really important to question uh, where our desires come from. Because we are told that as long as you consent to an act, then it miraculously becomes good we don't question it we don't put it to a moral standard anymore um, and i think for me realizing that desire does not come out of a vacuum it comes desire can be um, perpetrated desire can be created and fed to a person who is meant to believe that they want what they want this is when the system works when the subjugated people do not see the subjugation when they do think that it comes because they deserve it, because this is who they are. And this is something that I'm extremely resentful about when it comes to porn is that it tells women that it happens to them because they want it. And you cannot question it because it is you. You cannot feel bad about it because it is you. You, can, you don't have the separation because as Yahmur said, you see yourself in the subjugated woman and you feel a sort of enjoyment from it. And because of that, it becomes you. It becomes, you are the subjugated person and a perpetrator at the same time. That's why it's psychologically, it's very, it's, it's completely, it's distressing, but also a very powerful tool. Yeah. One of, um, so we have here a few like titles of actual videos on Pornhub and, um, and what like I mentioned Trisha saying about like racism, sexism, ageism and stuff. So uh, some of uh, the names that we can find it's uh, Black Slave Punished by White Master, uh, Gang Banked by Blacks, uh, uh, Thai Real Girls Violent Assault and Humiliation and um, I can't breathe, barely legal. Um, and we know that teen is one of the most popular categories on Pornhub. And incest is uh, more common than most of the people think it is. It is a taboo topic, of course, that who wants to be talking about, even though we feminists are 
bringing that up all the time, but who wants to be talking about men sexually abusing children and but it's happening in overwhelming numbers. We work with a lot of women that reveal insights, uh, insights to us and they call like years later saying it out loud for the very first time. Some of them call uh, because of um, a more recent sexual assault and reveals the childhood abuse after listening to other women sharing like similar stories, doing like a support group session, for example. Um, some call us uh, because they have the entire life forgotten what happened, but something triggered them and now they're struggling with it. Um, yeah, male violence shapes our, our lives profoundly and especially when the start point is during our, our, child, our girlhood. And uh, how can we separate uh, this reality from porn? How can we be okay with it if it's in a pornographic context? And it's such like a, a contradiction and hypocrisy where like incest is so taboo, but then it is very, very uh, popular on, on, in pornography. Yeah, we, uh, we know that incest themed porn, uh, it's one of the fastest growing categories of yeah. porn. And I think incest porn ranked in the top 10 searched categories on Pornhub. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, there's like a, it's, it's just disturbing how like no one, it's, um, um, this is real. Like if it's on the top 10 rank, and we know from our, from our lines that incest, it's way too common. And, but it's okay when it comes to porn, that's fine. Cause it's what, like their fetish or. And how often do you see, let's say fathers using oh. pornography to abuse their daughters? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that a common thing that you see in the woman you, you help? This is actually um, one of the, we heard of, from women who called our lines, of fathers who would leave like porn magazines, open in the mm -hmm. living room, or will like watch porn movies. While, while they're there, present. They're, yeah, and we heard that from women who were, who experienced incest. So yeah, it's part of the grooming into, um, mm -hmm. It's part of it, like, yeah. It's like normalizing, again, like you are a little child and like that it's playing on the screen and there's like magazines laying around. This is just, it's just the message that it's in, in your brain. And it's, it's like a figure that you trust doing this. So it's, it's very, yeah, it's part of the grooming to then like later on commit incest. The, the messages you had from your brother, right? He was clearly letting you know it's not, your your place in the family like he that was a clear message it's the problem now is that you're exposed to pornography any moment of your life anytime you watch tv you see terrible scenes extremely violent for me the most difficult for example was game of thrones when you watch a show like that and there's a man in the room they will be turned on by the rape or they will laugh at it and you will be reminded of your place as a woman yeah, it was very, it's true, like it was very normalized pornography in my house later on, like with internet and all that. So it started with the magazines, but it's true because by him telling how a woman should look like or, or just like by being so okay with the whole situation of having like pornified pictures around and yeah. It's definitely. And talking about normalization, I wanted to touch on OnlyFans also. Um, so for those of you watching and you don't know what OnlyFans is, um, it describes itself as a content sharing social media. Um, and it was created as an alternative to Instagram because in, on Instagram, you cannot put, uh, like there's some censorship, uh, which is a bit of hypocrite, but, um, and so now like you can, like women can go on OnlyFans, create an account and share content and users will pay for either being able to access their profile or for specific content. So you will see like, and it will go from bikini photos to really hardcore pornographic content. And it's not only porn on OnlyFans, but it is mostly porn. And it has been described as a more a sex worker friendly because uh, it's usually like the, the, it's a smaller cut of for users. So 20% versus typically like 40 or 50% on other sites like cam girls. Uh, but really like it, it, 
and it, can, it is less damaging than, than pornography in some ways where like in pornography, real women actually have to be physic like to perform the sexual acts physically. But what it does is really it, it objectifies it's, it normalizes the objectification of women's body where you can buy a picture of, of, of a naked woman doing something and also where you, you can also request specific or mm -hmm. um, content. content. Um, it really normalizes pornography and prostitution and making seem like glamorous that like it's, oh, I'm just on Instagram, I'm, I'm famous and, a lot, and it, like they can make money from it. But really the women that make the most money are the women that already had an online presence before. They're already sort of famous. And, and then that's where they, they will really make a lot of money. And it's, for me, it's like you are, uh, you are saying that it's true, like women doing OnlyFans, it's like less physically damaging and all that because they're not there performing it. But again, like only, there are so many privileges for you to actually have an OnlyFans account. You actually yeah. have a physical space that it's private, that you don't have a family around, that you can do that. You have to have equipment to be able to post like good quality content. So really like, again, if we are talking, we are talking about OnlyFans and normalizing it, and it is a privileged perspective because mm -hmm. you have to have a tons of privilege to actually be able to just be on OnlyFans and just have money coming from OnlyFans. And we know that women uh, do like, goes into prostitution and pornography out of like desperation for money and mm. so how you're going to have like a physical space equipment and everything to to be able to do it like this safe sex work yeah yeah but nevertheless i struggle with describing it in uh, in this framework of privilege because to me any woman who because of her socioeconomic background considers selling her own body for money for whatever reason that is already a sign of the subjugation that we're discussing to me it's truly just an expression of the same mechanism of this complete sexualization and objectification of yourself really but then putting in um, describing it as a choice or as a tactic of empowerment when in reality you're just upholding the same system that doesn't see you as a full human being so obviously i understand what you're trying to say because we know that there are so many women forced into prostitution or doing it out of desperation and facing extreme abuse um and and people doing on women doing only fans being the spokes women for the sex work movement is obviously ridiculous because it completely distorts the reality of the situation which is that it is a harmful business that traffics women for it um, however yeah putting in a framework of privilege to me doesn't seem fair and in the end it is she's not the one profiting the most because the pornographers yeah. the one the one guy that owns only fans um it was really like profit profiting the most making a lot of money and and then women are being ambassador of this site and mm -hmm. saying it's so great but the money goes to mm -hmm. the big guys yeah yeah to men. yeah uh do you want to yeah. some comments yeah um and so we were talking about um incest and how it's a theme in pornography and linda from the non-state torture um and she works with uh, jean and in Jean and my work, um, fam they see that families use porn to teach their children to endure torture. So it's, it's really something real happening. Mm -hmm. um, and also just a couple comments. So systemic destruction of a person or woman is exactly the goal of torture. Um, and we have posted, um, our, our member Hilla has posted the, the link for the Robert Jensen book so that um that yeah, people can go mentioned. can go and read porn cast a thick darkness over the male mind many thanks for bringing to daylight can Thank i just you. add something on what alex was saying because i completely agree with you i think it's completely misplaced to talk about privilege 
when there is such a thing as only fan in this world. And again, Florence, to build up, you were saying that at first you said the women who make the most money and the women who make the most money are men, right? It's, it's, it's men that, it's a, especially only fans, it's a father and his son who own this and they have very odd business around. And this is us believing that it can be even privileged to be on OnlyFans is us falling for the lie of the pornographer time and again. When if you look at the evidence, why shouldn't there be a brothel of women of camming? I mean, there is evidence of that where you take a woman, you lock them up each in their room and you put a camera instead of putting a punter. How do we actually know the conditions of this? What is, how can it be ever good as you were saying, Alexandra? And just one thing, we need to, Stop believing that women are privileged. We are not privileged. None of us is. Because why do I say this? Especially because of my French background. To me, the, the <laughs> privilege is something you have a birthright. By birth, we've already lost. We've already lost that the ultrasound scanner, that, that the echography that told them that we are girls. We've lost even before we've started. And this is something Anna Zomina was saying as well. How, why should I be called privileged for the basic application of my basic human rights? Just because I'm not raped every day, I'm called privileged. And privilege is a framework that is a lev leveling to the bottom. Because instead of talking about human rights, you talk about not being oppressed as a privilege when it should be the basis. Mm. So anything, you know, you start from the top and start in, in sort of, putting it as a basis. And every woman is under patriarchy. Even the Queen of England has to lie back and think of England when her husband rapes her because it's for the good of the country. You can't escape your condition as a woman. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm definitely gonna respond because I think you, you, you're both, talk, both talking about what I was saying about privilege. I think what I'm trying to say is that um, again like the normalization of only fans and how that's like a good alternative now like the pandemic brought uh only fans i call now that you 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 you, ha you can be on the sex industry in a safer way and the reality is that who can actually have a physical space without family members without kids around without uh that you can be there just like shooting your content and we we watch a bunch of like women on OnlyFans saying that uh for you to actually start making money you have to be hours and hours online and like be always like re releasing new content and stuff for you to actually have this whole time and have this physical space and have the money to buy equipment and all that this is certain you start from a privilege of being able to access all that i'm not saying that it's a privilege that I know that this woman themselves, just the fact that they are okay with selling their, their content and their bodies and the naked pictures, there's no privilege on that. But I mean, that, that can be the leading movement about the sex industry. That can be the topic of the sex industry. We can talk about uh, sex as work just because now you can have money from being at home, taking pictures or shooting videos of yourself. Mm -hmm. And our race and class are factors into exactly. like what brings us to um, to the only, only fans versus maybe other forms of, of pornography or prostitution. Yes. How do we even know? I mean, I'm sorry, but this is again a race to the bottom. Just because you know, it's like, oh, my husband doesn't beat me, so he's good. It's the same. Oh, just because I'm not in a German rival gangbang. So how do we even know actually that there is no that those are two distinct spaces? How do we, there is no evidence for that, that, you know, it's some people make this distinction of the so-called escort, but when you look at accounts of survivors from prostitution, they say that they have seen it all. They have been in the street and the brothel, so-called high hand, so-called low end. How do we actually know? And those images are there forever. The mental impact is still there. Um, we've already lost. As long as there's something as only fans, we've already lost and there is, we're losing at saying that there is any benefit to them. What do I know? For all I know in that room, outside that room, they could be a husband with a gun. So the fact that it's an empty room to me doesn't. But I think it also has, has some sort of like putting, um, I think what I'm trying to say is that that serves to the liberal uh, discourse when we put all the women uh, on the sex industry on the same level 
it is kind of adding to the liberal discourse that it's possible to be in the sex industry and be empowered and liberated. So I think there are uh, just the fact that we see ourselves as objects and as like the possibility of like selling our bodies as an option of our lives is true. Like we we are all. Um, that's not great. We are all born in an mm. oppressed class. That, that There's no doubt. But I think it's a disservice to actually mix the sex industry like it's all the same. It is not. If you, if you have the possibility of having a physical space, if you have the possibility of buying equipment, if you are a 20 years old young woman doing this, you have a privilege over that woman that was in street prostitution because before the pandemic. She has no option to go into OnlyFans, and that goes to many reasons. It could be because money, she can access the equipment and all that, but it could be because of her age and what actually women are, or the demand are looking for. So I think, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think we're in, in disagreement over that. Of course, there is a difference between a woman who's being trafficked into the sex business, sex industry, and a woman who decides to take pictures in her lingerie. Uh, I think what we're trying to see is that the system behind it is the same force and the subjugation mm -hmm. exactly, yeah. that brought us there is, is the same. The but demand, The demand yeah. comes from, from men and the money still goes majority of time for men for sure yeah. and I think yeah and I think it's fine I think what we're doing here is, is the process of consciousness raising I think <laughs> we all have the same goal and the same uh like perspective for sure but um it's good to have like different women like uh, articulating different ways mm -hmm. yeah and um yeah so let's talk a bit about our frontline examples because we wanted to to um to let you know what we hear from the women on the, on the front line. Uh, so we have women that uh, were porn influenced and uh, normalized attacks against them. Yeah, yeah uh, male violence against women came before porn and porn integrated. Men have been strangling women probably forever. It is such an easy way of hurting, humiliating and killing a woman. Mm -hmm. But having strangulation in mainstream porn as something pleasant and uh, as something that women like, as we were saying, like saying that women like to, to, to be strangled, for us frontline workers, it's absurd. It's, it's impossible not to make a connection between what we hear on the lines and pornography. We get calls from women uh, revealing they were strangled uh, during uh, intimate partners' physical assault pretty much every month. We almost don't go a month without a woman revealing to, uh, to us that she was strangled during uh, a physical assault. Um, and so, and when they reveal to us that they were physically assaulted by their intimate partners, we always try to get details from it. Like, did you, did he hit you in the head? Did he strangle you? Because uh, it might not have like physical injuries, but we know that it can have like um, internal injuries. And women have called us and revealed brain injuries from being strangled in the past by their partners. And women have told us that they had a heart attack one year after being strangled by their partners. And the doctor said that most likely there is a chance of being because she was strangled. So again, like the connection of pornography and male violence against women is just, it's just very clear. And we heard from women uh, that they were dating men and then uh, they would, the men would make them watch porn. And after a while in the relationship, uh, the men became aggressive and recreated some of the behaviors seen in porn, for example, like gagging with their penises. Um, we heard of, uh, we talked about that, the fathers that would leave porn magazines. Um, we heard from women whose male partners would force them to watch pornography and some were forced by the same partner to have sex with other men while they would watch. Um, or they would make their girlfriends um, reenact the porn uh, scenes for them. Women told us that boyfriends suffocated them with a pillow during sex out of the blue and would act like nothing happened afterwards. And we heard of women being raped and they, uh, the attacker put a garbage bag on their head. So it's clearly like, it, it's, it's quite violent. And... Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we we're talking about OnlyFans, and I know that this morning was released a um, article on revenge porn, and even like tons of like pictures that were leaked from uh, OnlyFans, and because the woman post post the pictures and videos themselves, it's just it's it's totally fine that um, that's happening. Like no one, it's. Um, seeing a problem uh, of like releasing again uh, content without the woman's consent because she was consenting to that specific page, right? Mm. Can you like, uh, you talk a little bit about um, like, okay. Yeah, Hila is saying that she's going to add the article about the revenge porn and OnlyFans on our chat right now and on Facebook comments too. And so do you have anything to say about the, uh, about revenge porn. I'll let you go first. <laughs> um, well, firstly, I think it's important to understand what is revenge porn because the name is quite misleading. Yeah. Um, it's it's actually it's so it's described as this distribution of sexually explicit images or videos without the consent of the person who is in it. Um, and it is most often being used to harass or intimidate a woman by her ex-partner or by her current partner and uh, coercing her into staying in a relationship or just doing something that the man wants her to do. Um, so uh, it is just manipulating, um, it's using the content that was consensually created um, against the will of the woman in it. Um, how, how where, where do we want to go with it? Uh, yeah, what do, what do you, how should we discuss it in the context of pornography? Yeah, well, I think, so we were, uh, another kind of, uh, theme or of what women told us on the crisis line is that men were actually creating and sharing porn. So they were creating their own and then afterwards uh, sharing or threatening to share. So some, um, like, like I said earlier, like I was coerced multiple times into like, take, like taking pictures of, of myself or my, having myself pictured. And so on top of um, influencing our sexuality, uh, sometimes men will make their own pornography and, and profit from it, from sharing it without the woman's consent. Um, so th that's kind of where we were, we were going. We have some examples of that, Danny. Yeah. yeah, we worked with a woman uh, whose husband's posted multiple videos and pictures of her naked or them having sex. So they consented to letting him film it, but never consented on those images being available to other men online and men uh, profit from it. We we're talking about mainstream porn websites like Pornhub paying men for a sex video posted without the consent of this woman. We work with women who in one woman in the relationship through looking at their partner's cell phone, they discovered that when they were sleeping, passed out, their partner sexually assaulted them or raped them and filmed it. And they didn't know they were assaulted and they didn't know he, he made pornography from it. And woman mm -hmm. call us to say that after breaking up with their batters, they were using her naked pictures to threaten her on daily basis as an emotional and psychological abuse after losing the physical power over her. Uh, these women are constantly terrified of being exposed to their family, to their friends, or really to, to anyone. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's truly terrifying and it's something um, that is becoming more and more prominent because, um, again, as young women, it's, it's, it's really normalized to send explicit pictures of yourself to your partner. It's considered a part of, um, of, a, of a relationship, of a healthy relationship. And then you lose control over those images um, and so you sort of lose control over your own autonomy in that sense. And so very often those images are used against the will of the woman. And I think uh, in the past few years, the conversation has been getting stronger because there 
have been multiple laws passed um, mm-hmm. in a few in few countries to tackle that issue, though it's not a new phenomenon because the the concept of revenge porn has existed since at least the eighties when men would send pictures of random women um, or their partners and they would send those naked pictures to uh, erotic magazines with information about uh, women's names and their their location their job and so the goal was to humiliate them the goal was to say this woman did not consent to me taking pictures of her she doesn't know that this picture is being sent and so those women who are uh, those men who are uh, getting off to those images, they're basically enjoying a lack of consent and the fact that mm-hmm. this woman did not enjoy, did not consent to this being to this happening, yeah. which is really disturbing. It is, and it's what Flo said that she said that probably you said that all your former yeah. partners probably have some sort of pictures or videos, and really like this is just. A power control so even when they lose the power they have over us physically they still have this emotional and psychological pressure and abuse over the woman and over us mm-hmm. because who wants your picture and your video like that exposed like that if you're not consenting mm-hmm. and um, I think like we talked a lot about how um, it's impossible to separate pornography of male violence and what we hear on the lines and everything like that. Uh, I'm curious, do you think that you can talk a little bit about the rough sex defense in UK? Um, Yeah, there are a few things just when you were talking about physicality, it's like men lending their husbands to their friends because it's their possession, right? So they can share with friends and today they can share the images like baseball cards that you exchange as a child. Like notice it's boys that play with this as kids and they do the same thing as adults, they carry on. And also the article that was published this morning was really good because it was doing the connection between so-called mainstream pornography and revenge pornography because pornography to core has this element of revenge. It is an instrument of blackmail because once you're in pornography, your life is over everybody has seen you can't do anything anymore so it's the same instrument of blackmail and I think that the only difference between revenge pornography and pornography is not even consent it's money the only difference is that women are not paid for it Mm -hmm. and money is not evidence of consent on the contrary it's absence of consent because you have to be paid to do something you didn't want Um, and about the rough sex defense so I saw, I think it was Linda uh, in, the, in the chat, uh, she was talking about how femicides go unnoticed because of that. So mm-hmm. what happens is that now men, they've been doing this for a while, but now that after killing their uh, partner, they say, oh, it was a sex game gone wrong. And so there is this movement in the UK called We Can't Consent to This that explains precisely how that is being used as an excuse to get away with it. And so this is the theme of sexual uh, sadism. And there is this French legal scholar called Muriel Fabre-Magnon that makes a very good argument about it. She says that if we can let people, if we can let men get away with murder, torture, humiliation, uh, battering, just because it is sex, then it means that you can qualify anything as sex and get away with it. Mm -hmm. So the implication of this, it's a Pandora box and it's massive. It's actually, it's it's so absurd that how, how, how even, even if the woman was consenting about being strangled during sex, how do you kill someone (laughs) by mistake? how you don't, you don't have control over your hands and over the strength that you're putting that is just so absurd. But of course, of course, that will, that will be used by the defense. We see how, um, how dirty and low the defense goes when we talk about uh, sexual assault, uh, let alone like murder, of course. Yeah. I mean, but the link with pornography is so direct. It's basically what pornography does. It says, Violence is sex. 
So yeah. it's, it's, it's just the same thing, but applied um, in intimate relationships. Yeah. Some, uh, some questions from the audience, if you're willing. Yeah. Um, so let's come check. Uh, do you think that the degradation and violence against women in porn is one of the driving forces behind the huge increase of girls wanting to uh, trans, uh, transition to becoming male? Anybody want to respond? I think there's a lot. There was a good article in the Object uh, website, uh, Object Women Not Sex Objects about the movement for asexualism. So women calling themselves asexual because of what you said, Alex, about violence is sex. And when you see that that is all to it, you don't want it anymore, really, rightly so. Mm. Uh, I would think it plays in it because it's within the general framework of male violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, I think it, it, it really depends because we know that it can play it plays a, a huge role as we we're saying about our own experience in how we see ourselves and how we see our bodies and how we sexualize and objectify ourselves. And so this hate that we create from our bodies from a very early age without even understanding uh, where it's coming from. And uh, you, can, you, you can express the hate for, for your body in different ways. Yeah, I feel like porn really establishes this inherent link between being a woman and being an object. So if you are exposed to pornography from a very young age, you, it's very easy to dehumanize yourself, to do not see yourself as a subject in your life. So if you do feel like you do want to have autonomy over your life, it just becomes natural to escape from womanhood, from being a woman. And Nowadays, with the rise of identity politics as well, it's very, it seems like an easy fix to this problem of seeing yourself as an object. Right. Good point. Another question. I'm wondering if sex has been totally separated from affection for the younger generation. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, I think we've painted this really dark picture. Um, but I also wanted to say that there is a lot of hope when it comes to young people, young women still enjoying sex. I think there is a huge need amongst women, but there I say people, <laughs> for intimacy, um, for closeness. Um, and I think that's, yeah. <laughs> what what we're doing me. here, I think like, and your group, young woman, targeting young woman. Yeah. Um, I think having these conversations, uh, consciousness raising, that's definitely like the solution to not happen. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, but also I am really passionate about sex because I really enjoy sex. I think sex is a beautiful thing, even though I've had such um, difficult experiences with sex and my own sexuality, I do think that Sex is a beautiful way to connect to your partner, to find, to build intimacy. And that's why I'm so passionate about this movement against pornography, because I think it really deprives us of that. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, it is, there is a, another huge conversation on what sex could be and what it mm -hmm. could give to a woman in a healthy relationship. But obviously that's another different topic. <laughs> I think that, like I'm not sure it's been separated, but I think like, affection is bit, is now maybe we think that violence is affection. We think that like lack of consent is affection, or like the ways that we interact, or like young and for young women like me or younger girls that like like not that it's okay to not like you know the lack of consent, not asking to kiss to to give a kiss and things like that. So I think maybe it's that's where it's happening not necessarily a complete separation of affection and sex mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's the it's the it's the very misogynistic conception of connection between violence and sex again once more yeah um, um yeah what to say I, I was gonna read some comments okay go ahead um so 
look at the research where men admit that porn inspires them and gives them ideas of how they want to be sex sexually and act with women in real life. Porn has worsened the, the fetishizing and eroticizing of patriarchal oppression. It has normalized it more. Uh, BDSM has normalized strangulation also. Um, this, is, this all shows how important it is to teach girls that they have a sense of self in a relationship with themselves, right? And that goes also with the work that, that you're doing. Um, yeah, I don't see any other questions. I don't know if you saw anything or... No, I don't see it here yeah. either. Uh, do you have anything else to add? I think we're going to talk a little bit about some calls for action. Now. And what to do now, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it will be frustrating just be talking about the problem and not. Um, which is kind of like an action too. Like, yeah, yeah, talking is, is action for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, then um, I first, uh, in 1985, Vancouver Rape Relief uh, called for, in, in, in a, a piece that was written, we still use it today, it's called The Truth As We Know It. And it was calling for men to stop watching porn. And we are still asking for men to stop watching porn. I think that's definitely a, a good start. And women, I want to tell you, you have the right to ask for the men in your lives to stop watching porn, to not watch it. It's, it. Before I came to Rape Relief, I didn't know I had this option to stop asking, to, to, to ask my partners not to watch. So I want to, uh, women that are listening, I want you to know that you're allowed. Yeah. And I guess that ethical or feminist porn, it is not the demand and where the real money is. So it is such a distraction talking about it while the 97 billionaire industry is relying mainly on male violence against women. And we also know how useful um, it's talking about our personal experience and uh, also around like pornography. And uh, I, I call you to follow one campaign called uh, Because I Was a Girl and Because I Am a Woman on Facebook. And you can send your comments, um, share your stories and your experiences around male violence in general, but about pornography specifically now we're talking about. Um, I and you can send it and it can be shared anonymously I find that very, for me personal, I sent some, some of my experiences and when I saw it shared, it was so reassuring because a lot of women were commenting, I've been through the exactly the same thing or all the power of solidarity. So for me, it, it, was, it was amazing to hear like women reassuring my experience and again, like contextualizing that it's not like an individual experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have some... Uh campaigns and petitions I want to talk about, but I wanted to ask you, do you uh, have any, want to recommend any campaigns or boy, boycotts or other examples from around the world that you know uh, around pornography? I know you mentioned, I was going to talk about Ozzy Le Feminist in France. Um, you already mentioned that that's great. Any other things you would like to recommend? Maybe we need to stop asking them to stop watching pornography. You know, it's too kind to just ask that. Um, <laughs> if we're going to ask something, we have to ask them, so what do you watch then? You know, go to your teacher, male teacher, what do you watch? Tell me, justify this to me. This is the position we should be in. Tell me what you watch. Yeah. Tell me why you watch it. And how do you justify this to me? How can you pretend we are friends? How can you pretend you keep on talking to me because this is we're always in the defense we feminists we're always like oh people stopped talking with me because of my position on men wanting to be women because of my position on prostitution well no you sit down with me and you tell me why you think pornography is fine and why you think what makes a man a woman you have to explain that to me so attack <laughs> <laughs> I, I love this it's so radical i love it <laughs> um i think i would also add that in this whole conversation about women and their sexuality i think it's important to embark on your own journey of healing because porn does a huge damage to you as a person to your sense of self as we established and i think um either you can do it on your own you can do it with a, with a loving partner um 
but I think the first step is to distance yourself from violent imagery, from pornography, uh, because it's, it's harmful to you as a human being. So distancing yourself and then exploring what actually sex and intimacy mean to you. I think that's crucial in the context of women reclaiming their own sense of self, autonomy and sexuality. Yeah, we were talking about um, demanding men to stop watching porn and all that. Um, so there is a Brazilian um, page called, um, if you say in Portuguese, Recuse a Clicar, which will be um, like refuse to click, basically. And what I find interesting about this specific page is that there is like a group specific, like women only, there, there is a group men only, and there is the whole page. And what I find in, in, interesting is that uh, the page welcomes uh, men to the conversation around pornography because at the end of the day they are the consumers and it's it's filmed male violence against women and because we know that men some men participate on the conversation around being anti-porn but we always see uh men talking about the how harmful it is for them physically and their relationship and uh the erectile, um, did I say that right? Dysfunction and, and like physical aspects and harms of porn for them, but they uh, leave out, of course, the whole thing about male violence against women, which that's what we're bringing up. So I think that what the page it, uh, does is very interesting that it, the page welcomes men to the conversation, but they are constantly releasing the harms of porn for women and what it's doing to uh, the relationship between a man and a woman. So I find very interesting, um, probably, for, so for you watching and you speak Portuguese, just have a look on the, the, the Facebook page as well. And there's also, um, Danny, you were, uh, wanted to tell us about Pornhub, right? Because there's a bit of traction around Pornhub and, and shutting down Pornhub. And recently in Thailand, uh, there was... Yeah, I know that Thailand recently shuts down Pornhub for violating uh, Computer Crimes Act. And so there is this, and we know that during, during the pandemic, they were like giving free premium subscription. And there was like this huge increase on the consumption of porn um, because of it as well. Uh, so Thailand shuts down Pornhub for violating computer crimes. And um, there was a letter here in Canada sent to the justice minister uh, at the day of International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And the letter was signed by 20 Canadian senators and uh, MPS, um, MP, sorry. Um, yeah, so basically they are asking for, for to, to Canada to take actions against Pornhub as well. And um, I know, I, I find it interesting that they actually um, added that um, in addition to publishing videos of child abuse, sexual assault, and sex trafficking, Pornhub also publishes videos that portray misogynistic and gender-based violence, explicit racism and hate speech, minors, incest, voyeurism, and intimate image. Mm -hmm. I found, like, I was pleased to read that because we know that it's a lot about sex trafficking, child abuse, and things like that, but it's actually saying that the message also on the consensual videos are also not not mm -hmm. great. So that happened on November 25th. And we want Canada to act because Pornhub is based in Montreal. It's owned by MindGeek. Um, and what I found is there's a Montreal-based group called uh, Arrêté Exploitation Hub. They want to shut down Pornhub, but they're doing an action every week, every Thursday, uh, in front of the head office of MindGeek, who owns Pornhub. Uh, and they've been doing that every week, I think, since September. Um, sorry, I invite you if you're in listening and you're in Montreal to join them. And also there is a global petition all around the world to shut down Pornhub. So not only to regulate Pornhub, but to shut it down. Yeah. It's yeah. Trafficking hub. Yeah. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Traffickinghubpetition.com. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Alexandra for having this conversation Thanks. with us today. Uh, so thank great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for uh, everyone, the viewers, um, for tuning in on Zoom and later on on Facebook that we had a little problem. Uh, this video will 
be available on demand immediately on Facebook. Uh, it would on Facebook it would start a, a little late, but we will release the whole recording from Zoom uh, shortly. And uh, we invite you to watch tomorrow's event, which is Abolition of Prostitution, the International Feminist Overview Part 2. So if you haven't seen yet the Part 1, just go to our Facebook page, you can find it there, and then tune in tomorrow for the Part 2. Uh, you can watch live on Facebook, hopefully, or join uh, on Zoom. And for all the details, um, for the Zoom link and everything else, you can visit our website, www.reprelieveshelter.pc.ca. Thank and go so check much. out Radical Girls also on their social media, their website. Amazing content. Yeah. Thank you so much, woman. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot.